Chapter 39 Presenting the most honorable Willigig T. Pinkerton, Marquis of Rock Turtle Cove, announced the White Rabbit, accompanied by his wife, Lady Edonia Pinkerton, Marchioness of Rock Turtle Cove, and daughter, Lady Kath. Kath stuffed a rosebud embroidered handkerchief into the rabbit's mouth. He startled and peered up at her with wide eyes. Already on the third step into the ballroom, her parents paused and glanced back. Kath flashed them a tight smile. Go on, she said. I think it will be more fitting for me to be announced separately. She turned her cool gaze back to the master of ceremonies. As is befitting for the future Queen of Hearts, don't you think? The Marquis and Marchioness exchanged surprised but pleased looks before descending down the rest of the steps. The rabbit pulled out the handkerchief. His expression flashed between irritation and complacency as he cleared his throat. Of course, Lady Pinkerton, rightly so, indeed. He puffed up his chest in an attempt to reclaim his dignity and blew into his trumpet again. Presenting Lady Catherine Pinkerton of Rock Turtle Cove. Better, she said, and swooped down toward the floor, her shoulders peeled back. Though she could imagine how collected she must appear on the outside, her mouth tasted of stale fruitcake. She did not make eye contact with any of the guests, glad that the bejeweled masks made it easy to pretend she didn't recognize the costumed guests surrounding her. A pair of skunks tried to approach her, and she suspected they were hoping to get into the good graces of their soon-to-be queen, told others that they were, but she glided away before a greeting could be uttered. She would not pretend that she wanted or needed the approval of the noble sycophants. Catherine, a damp hand grasped her elbow, spinning her around. Margaret Merle dipped into a curtsy. Her mouth was pinched in a smile, her nose hidden behind a pale pink snout. Have you heard the wonderful news? Kath found it impossible to smile back, despite Margaret's overjoyed expression. I don't believe I have, she said without much enthusiasm. Margaret let out a dreamy sigh. The Duke has asked for my father's permission to begin a courtship with me. I can hardly believe it to be so. And yet it is. We are to have our first chaperone visit tomorrow afternoon. Oh, Lady Catherine, I'm full plumped up with satisfaction. Linking her arm with calves, she waved a fan over her flushed face. The moral of that, of course, is that the caged canary does not eat from the hands of vipers. Catherine tore her arm away and rounded on her. Stuff and nonsense, Margaret. Margaret blinked. Pardon? What does that even mean? The caged canary does not eat from the hands of vipers. Vipers don't have hands, and would a canary truly prefer to be caged than take a risk on someone who might seem dangerous? But, but maybe they aren't dangerous at all. Maybe the viper only wants to share some bird seed. Did you think of that when you were concocting your ridiculous moral? Margaret stepped back. What? I don't think you comprehend. I comprehend well enough. Your so-called morals are nothing but an excuse to act better than the rest of us, to treat us as though we are not as clever or as righteous as you, when really all you're doing is trying to hide your own insecurities. It's childish and contemptible, and I've put up with it long enough. Margaret's cheeks turned the same color as the strapped-on nose. Why, I... That isn't fair. I've never... She huffed. This is unacceptable, Lady Pinkerton. I hope that you, more than anyone, would be happy for me. But I see now that you've been harboring too much envy to be mollified. I suppose it's true that I've always held myself to a higher standard than you. 
but I've done my best to keep you in my good graces nevertheless, to try and raise you to my level so you could see the error of your ways. Please spare me. Margaret's eyes darted past her and widened. Ah, fair evening, my lord. To you as well, my lady. Catherine turned to Lord Varthog, who had joined them, his small ears trembling with joy. He was wearing a snout to match Margaret's, though it hardly changed the look of his face at all. She rolled her eyes in disgust. How do you do, Lady Pinkerton? he asked. Not as well as some, it would seem. Lady Pinkerton? Margaret said through her teeth. Is out of sorts tonight. I am most sorry to hear that. I actually wondered if I might have a word with you, although. He cleared his throat, and his voice softened. Only after Lady Merle tells me whether she might have any openings left on her dance card. Something tells me you'll have your pick of them. Catherine grumbled, but her low insult went ignored as Margaret and the Duke flirted and flustered until Margaret made some comment about powdering her nose and bustled away. The draped fabric of her gown swayed behind her as she marched into the flurry of coattails and petticoats, and the Duke watched as dopey-eyed as a flamingo. Good riddance, Catherine cursed after her. Beg pardon, Lady Pinkerton, said the Duke. She sneered. For shame, Your Grace. You should know better than to eavesdrop on a girl when she's grumbling to herself. Ah, oh, yes, I do apologize. The Duke rubbed at his jaw. Please, finish your thoughts. Catherine crossed her arms over her chest. Margaret was egotistical and wearisome, and for all his faults, the Duke could have done better for himself. But what business was it of hers? Not at all, perhaps, though it filled her with loathing. Margaret, of all people, Insidious, obnoxious Margaret was being courted by a man who adored her. There would be no hiding and no shame, and everyone would bless them joyfully and wish upon them many snout-nosed children. Shall I speak now? She grunted. Fine, go ahead. I am very sorry to see you feeling so poorly, Lady Pinkerton, said the Duke. I wanted to thank you. I'm not sure what involvement you might have had in turning Lady Merle's affections toward me. But, well, a favor for a favor, I believe our deal was. He grinded around his tusks. The storefront is vacant now, if you weren't aware. I understand if you've no longer any interest, given the, the situation with the king. His eyes twinkled, and for a moment, Catherine feared he might wink at her, but he didn't. But should you still want to lease the building from me? I could hardly deny you anything. Her jaw began to ache from grinding her teeth. The storefront was hers. Now, when she had no hope of a blessing from her parents, nor a shilling from her dowry, nor an ounce of respect from her peers if she dared to reject the king's proposal. Now, when her friendship with Marianne was over, is that all? The Duke frowned. Why, yes, I suppose. Aren't you pleased? She forced an annoyed breath through her nostrils. I am not. I'm afraid, though, it's through no fault of your own. Forcing her tight shoulders to loosen, she pressed her hands into her heavy skirt. Thank you, Your Grace, but I don't think you should reserve the storefront for me. There is never going to be any bakery, and there certainly isn't going to be one now. Please forget we ever spoke of it, and go dance with your lady. She has already spent too many waltzes watching from the sidelines. She left before she could feel the full sting of his happiness, but she had not gone far when a hand grabbed her forearm, squeezing so tight Catherine nearly choked. She tried to yank her hand away, but was tugged back against an iron-solid chest. 
A gruff voice growled into her ear. What do you do with it? Warm breath rolled over her, smelling of pumpkin. Peter Peter was clutching her arm, his fingers pressing indentations into her flesh. There were purple-gray circles beneath his eyes and a deep gouge across one cheek, like someone had attacked him with a knife. Though the wound was healing, the sight of it made her stomach flip. He was wearing muddied coveralls and no mask, as if he had no idea there were expectations around attending a royal masquerade. What you do with it? He growled again. What are you... Release me this instant! His grip tightened. Answer me! I don't know what you're... Oh. You know, you and your wife could stand to learn some manners when it comes to... He yanked her closer and Kath gasped, dwarfed by his hulking shoulders. Then, surprisingly, he did let go. She rubbed her arm, pulse racing. I don't know what that maid of yours saw or thought she saw, he said, his menacing voice barely carrying in the crush of music and laughter. But I won't let you hurt her. I will see you made into warm food before I allow it. Now tell me what you've done with it. I don't know. She started to shake her head, but stopped. Was this about the pumpkin she'd stolen? The cake she'd made? That his wife had been so desperate to eat? I, I'm sorry, she sputtered. I just used it to make a cake. Just that one cake. I didn't think it would do any harm, and it was just one little pumpkin. And you seemed so busy, and I only wanted... His hand latched around her arm again, and she yelped. I already know about that, he growled. I was there at the festival. I saw what happened to that turtle, and now my wife. He inhaled sharply, his nostrils flaring. I don't know what you're playing at, but I'm not an idiot. The whole kingdom saw you with that sword. Now tell me what you've done with it. Her heart caught in her throat. Sword? You mean the Vorpal sword? Her thoughts roiled. What does that have to do with pumpkin cake? His eyes flamed and he shook her again. She hissed through her teeth, sure he was leaving bruises. I will ruin you, Lady Pinkerton. Mark my words if anything happens to her before I can fix this. That is enough, Sir Peter, Kath said, raising her voice when she remembered the role she'd sworn to play this evening. Everyone believed she was to be their future queen. Surely she wouldn't stand to be spoken to in this way by a measly pumpkin farmer. I demand that you release me at- Pardon my intrusion. A voice as warm and soothing as melted chocolate slipped between them. A shock jolted down Catherine's spine. She fell silent, her lips hanging open. If the lady's card isn't full, continued the voice, might I request the honor of this next dance? Soft leather brushed against her upper arm. Her gaze fell, watching as a gloved hand pried Peter's fingers off her, one by one. She was afraid to look up, afraid to meet the speaker of the voice and find she was wrong. For he couldn't be here. Not even his bravado would have brought him here. It was impossible.